Hey everybody, I'm Frank Bello from Anthrax and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi everyone, John Liebman here. You're watching the number one site for learning bass online for BassPlayersOnly.com, where I've taken all the frustration out of learning bass so you could build confidence, have fun, and just enjoy playing music. It's not for everyone, it's for bass players only dot com we have a very special guest this week frank bello you know him from uh, of course anthrax and you may have seen him in a couple other places too hello frank hello john how are you <laughs> i'm doing Happy great monday i know uh, it's monday right it's monday man it's okay it's monday yes yes i what i was gonna say i was, I was trying to remember the first time you and i ever met and i i remembered i was i was having lunch with Stu ham in a uh, Mexican food place, uh, just a few blocks down from SIR Studios in Hollywood. Ah, Stewie. That's the first time you and I met. And I've also, I've seen you perform with Anthrax. I've seen you uh, uh, jam with, with my buddy, David Ellison. Of course. And uh, I'm just, I'm really happy. I've wanted to do this interview for a long time. I know we've tried and we've never been able to get our schedules to link up. So I'm well, especially exactly. happy to be you talking can, with you now. I'm a fan. Obviously, I'm a fan of, of, of your, your site. I think it's great. It, anything that teaches and forwards our plight our plight of bass playing to people just to make it easier for them so they can feel the same thing you and I feel. I think that's very important to make it easy and put it, look, it, don't be, don't be freaked out by this, this little thing. You can learn, you can, you know what I mean? I, I, I think there's a lot of players sometimes and they don't, they don't think about this. People can get intimidated out of playing. So I think what you do is important to make it easier, to make it, to make it approachable. That's, that's a really big thing with me. That's when, when I do my clinics, I tell I want to bring people to ease and say, look, it's four strings. I want to make it as simple as possible. Not be, I mean, there's a lot to do with those four strings, of course, but I want to get them, I want to get that spark in them. You know what I mean? To get that, get that spark so they can play that E note. It's like, oh, I played a note and get onto the second note, right? That's, the, that's, that's where we get the next generation from. We've been very lucky to do this. So for me, it's all about paying it forward now. It's like, I want to see the next generation of bass players, musicians, and great songwriters. It's really important that this continues because it's given us so much. I have some stuff that I want to talk to you about, and I, I don't want to get too heavy, but I usually start out, so tell me about your childhood and your musical upbringing and how'd you become a bass player? And your upbringing was uh, not exactly the Brady Bunch. <laughs> and you, you were the oldest of five kids. Yeah. Dad took off when you were what, about 10 years old. Yeah. You got that crap beat out of you on your way to school pretty much every day. I mean, how did how did you get through all that, Frank? Oh, everybody's got their story. Look, mine isn't the worst. And it's not the best. I was very, very lucky the way I look at it. So I take it as a positive thing. This taught me the, the rules of life. Honestly, John. Yeah. My dad took off when I was 10. Family of five. Um, and look, we were set up pretty well. My dad had a good job. And he paid the bills. My mom was a home, you know, a housewife, they called it in those days. Um, she didn't have a job. She didn't have a license. So when he took off, all of a sudden, there was no money. She didn't have a job. No money was coming in. We lost the house. So we had to move to a really, you know, a, a really seedy kind of section uh, uh, area, neighborhood, uh, where I, I would join that school. I went into that school and literally got my ass kicked. I'm not saying... There was a skip day. There was every day I got my ass kicked from these specific two guys. There's only one path to school. I tried to do everything else to go around them. You hid under a car to get to, to get less kicks in the face and punches. But they would kick me. And that's it's, this is all through therapy, dude. <laughs> Believe me. So um, to get away from the punches because there was a barrage. This is during going. Imagine going to school and to get away from these kicks and punches. The only safety I had because there was nobody else you know, there to help. I had to go under a car near the muffler. I can hug a muffler like nobody, believe me. But um, to hug, you know, to get to the play, the center of the play of the car underneath the car to get away from the punches. That was until I just waited. There. I was late for school almost every day because just to get away from. It. I would go into the principal and tell him why. I said, "Dude, this is." I say, "Dude," but I said, yeah. "This is why I'm late. Look at this cut here. See this fat lip? Guess what happened?" And he goes, "No," you know. And they would just, you know, it, it got ugly. But what, long story what? short, so I had to move out of that area. And that leaves scars, believe me, it leaves scars throughout your life. But it almost it also made me work harder. 
You know, I went to karate school. I went to all that stuff to learn. And it showed me discipline. It really, it showed me something. So I take, I take that, you know, lemons into lemonade kind of vibe. Yeah. And that's through therapy, through all that stuff. It, it teaches you, look, all right, this happened. This traumatic thing happened. How did you, how do you rise above that? And it, it kind of showed me that you can. And uh, mm-hmm. I try to teach my 16 year old boy that, you know, this is what happened. You can rise from this, you know? So I just want to let you know that story. This is what can happen. And this is what you have to do to get past that. If mm-hmm. There's bumps, there's bumps in a lot of, a lot of potholes in life. You have to get above that. All right. As I said, I, I don't want to get too heavy, but I, I do want to ask you about Anthony, your brother. You lost yeah. your brother, Anthony. And all I can think is you must have said, you know, why does all this stuff keep happening? What, how, how do you, you know? Well, yeah, you, you ask all those questions. And just for the, for the people watching right now and listening, my brother, Anthony, this is all in my book. Um, right. That's why it's, it's easier to talk because once the book came out and it was cathartic, it was very cathartic. And it, aside from the therapy that I had to go through, this made it easy because everybody knew the story because a lot of people asked, about, asked about, it, uh, about the story. So my brother at 23 years old, in the Bronx, New York, was murdered uh, on the streets in, in the Bronx. Uh, it was a very ugly, ugly scene. Uh, the guy he knew, it was one of those things, uh, words were said and all that stuff and back and forth. The next time the guy saw, saw him, he was ready for him. He waited outside a coffee shop. When my brother came out of the coffee shop, he, sh- he shot him down right in the street in front of a lot of witnesses that refused to you know to say anything and refused to go on the stand and all that stuff. And, it became very much like a Martin Scorsese film uh, in the Bronx criminal courts. And I, I pray, I could only pray that nobody watching this or listening to this ever has to go through a court system like that. Cause that is the ugliness of life. You no, know, there's no doubt in my mind. I don't, I, I would never, never put that on anybody, but you know, he was, you know, let loose. He was the justice system sucks in my opinion, you know, especially um, when you have the, when you have the goods on them, when you have the proof and everything else and they just let them go anyway. So I'm very, I'm obviously still very bitter about that, but um, yeah, so that, that scar, it's still a scar, you know, that never leaves you and you, you learn how to adapt, you know, and it takes a while. Believe me, you, a- you mentioned something. Uh, it was either in the book or in an interview. You said, it's all about how you can take a punch and get back up and move on with your life. Exactly. It's, it, it's very important to me that people know, and look, everybody's got stories in their life. People have, a lot of people have a lot worse off than I have. So I, I just look at myself. I'm, I'm very thankful. I'm number one, I'm six feet above ground, right? I'm not below the ground. So it could have been, at that time, after my brother's death, I kind of snapped. And this is all through therapy. I could talk about this stuff now. I kind of snapped and I went, uh, I wanted revenge to be honest. And I went after and I stalked because I knew who it was and all that stuff. And I, the first time in my life, I, I, I had a, I had a gun uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't right. And believe me, it was, it was very, very scary because I didn't know who I was. I went very dark for two, it was a two week span of my life. After that, I just didn't know how anthrax didn't matter. Music didn't matter. It just was tunnel vision, man. I'm, I'm, and it was a very scary time in my life because I, I went dark and I couldn't get out of this zone. Like at 10 o'clock at night, I got, got in my car ready, dressed the right way. It was going to happen as soon as I saw it. And that's the scariest I, I've ever found about myself. I've never felt scared, scared, uh, as scared about who I was because I wasn't me. I wasn't me. And um, I just stalked and waited. And thank God. Thank God, because I, I definitely wouldn't have been speaking to you because I if I did what I wanted to do, because I would have been in jail or dead, probably dead first because of retribution and all that stuff. But um, it was the scariest, darkest time in my life. And around two weeks, I'm sitting in the car. I remember it just came to me one day. I'm sitting in the car, just waiting, staring at that same place that he was coming out of. I didn't see him yet. hadn't seen him yet. And I just, it just came to me as I'm holding this piece of metal in my hand that, that I didn't want to, you know, I didn't, it was so foreign to me. It was so foreign, but it was a mission. Long story short, I just had this thing. I started to think about my mom. I said, look, if I do this, she loses another son. Either way, she loses another son. She's going to put the double, double pain on her. You can't do that. You, you, you just can't do that to her. Cause it, that was her baby who, who was murdered. My boy, my brother was her 
for baby. So it was, it was a very, very tough thing. Uh, I said, and then I, I said, I'm going to lose my, my, well, it was my girlfriend at the time. I was going to lose her. My wife was my, now my wife. I said, my family, I'm going to lose all that anthrax, obviously. So all this, all this, all this stuff started to like seep into my mind. I said, what the fuck am I doing? So it kind of pulled me out and I just decided that was the time. That was the time I'm going to go. So, and that, that was it. So I'm so glad that didn't happen. I got rid of that, that gun. I got, I, I did all the right things. I, I'm just so glad I pulled out of that place, took off. And it was really the best thing I've ever done to, to get out of that because I was on a really bad path. There's no way I would have been around. I don't think. Well, let's talk about music because that can be very healing Yes. And very therapeutic. Uh, how did, uh, how and when did music become such a big part of your life? Obviously, it was before this incident, but yeah, well, me music, you... because of, you know, I, it's my outlet. It's everybody's outlet. Everybody has this beautiful thing. And we have this gift that we're given everybody, everybody, this, this God given gift, I believe, this outlet of music. When we're in a bad mood, we're in a bad way, we have a bad day. You can go to listen, put your headphones on, and it takes you away. It takes you away. It's very important in life, I think. I'm glad my son has it for the you know, an outlet from school and all that other stuff he's going through. It, it, it's a great, great, it's a pleasurable thing of life. So I think it's one of the life's great pleasures. So with dealing with this abandonment thing all my life, music was always my outlet. But when my mom and dad were yelling at each other in the, in the other room, guess what? I could put my headphones on. And that would take me to another place. That's very important for people to hear. I, I say this to the younger people watching this. Or, you know, even if you're going through some bad times, just use music, especially if you're a player. So then the playing got into me. I said, look, I want to be able to create this stuff. I want to be the, able to emulate my heroes. It was so important. So I started on guitar. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't playing guitar. I was really playing the bass parts on guitar. <laughs> yeah, I was playing, I hear bass. When I first play, when I first hear a song, I don't go to the melody. I don't go anything anywhere else. I go right to the bass. I hear what the bass line's going. And that's, it's just, I've always been like that. So, you know, I, I was jamming with my drummer, Charlie Benanti, who I grew up with. He's my uncle, Charlie yeah. Benanti. And he, he'd be playing guitar and I'd be jamming along with him. And he says, you know, you're playing the bass parts on the guitar. So him and my friend, Mike, they were the ones that told me, why don't you just switch the bass? It makes obvious sense what you're doing. And I did that, John, and it clicked. It was obvious where I, I knew, you know, you're home. You know, you're home. I was home because it just made all the sense in the world. I can play the stuff I was hearing, you know. And don't get me wrong. I love playing guitar also. I love writing songs on guitar. It's, it's great. But bass is always my first love because that's, I think that's just where my my ear is, you know, and my I heart. Want to ask you about your your bass influences. By the way, I thought Gene Simmons wrote a really good forward to you. Thank your you. Book. I agree. I agree. I, you know, <laughs> and, and I told him this. I've never heard him speak as openly about this because I know Gene quite a long time, and he's great. He's a great man. You know, everybody knows the persona of Gene on stage, but he's really a really a heartfelt guy. He's a really soulful, beautiful person. He's a, he's a great dad. I love that about him too. He's a great dad. And he's a very, very underrated bass player. If you listen to Gene Simmons' bass lines, he's a very, very underrated bass player. Listen to some of those great Kiss songs. He's doing stuff that just helps the song. That makes it's Paul McCartney. He's like a very, a very Paul McCartney kind of vibe. He does those these lines, Mike, like that makes sense for the vocals. You just built up the vocal, Gene. And if you listen to how he he just really, he really follows through with the song. He makes the song more uh, interesting. He really does. Listen to Gene's bass playing. So to get him to do my, number one, that was a big get, to get Gene as a diehard Kiss fan from way back. He was one of my heroes growing up. I said, I want to do that. You know, he, I, when I was a kid, I want to do that. And Paul Stanley, you know, Kiss in general, that show they had, these great songs, in my opinion. Um, yeah, they were one of my things. So to have him come, it's full circle for me. So to have Gene Simmons write for me, it was it was a, a heartfelt, really serious uh, forward to this book. And I see, I knew Gene. I met his mom. She was a beautiful, beautiful person. I loved her. I never, I, I didn't know his dad, but I loved what he wrote about it. And I, I never knew that stuff before I read that. I was, I was really I taken back either. from it. It was beautiful. 
Yeah. And I, I met him one time, uh, we were on an airplane together from, uh, from LA to Detroit. So it was a long flight, but I, I talked to him, actually, I talked to him afterwards because this was around the time my rock base book was coming out. And I was talking to him about maybe endorsing it or writing a forward or whatever. And he said, uh, well, I said, I think the first thing I said, I have a site called uh, for bass players I, I don't remember how I started the conversation, but he says, I, I'm not really a fan of bass players. And <laughs> I said, what? And then he, he's from Israel, right? So I, I started talking to him in Hebrew. And really? I asked, yeah. I asked awesome. him in Hebrew, how come you don't like bass players? And uh, he, he didn't even bat an eye that, that, I, that I asked him in Hebrew. But he, he said that, uh, you know, unless you're Paul McCartney or, or you know, or unless you're in the front, you're, you're just in the background. Yes. Yeah, unless I you're writing songs and which, which I don't really, I, I don't like the word background. I like the word supportive, mm. but uh, anyway, we did get him. He is one of our interviews. That's great. And you artists. know what? That, that's a great, that's a great get because Gene, for, in my opinion, is still underrated for what he does. He, the man is in his seventies, still killing it. In my opinion, when I see him, he's, he's still inspiring me. Not because he wrote my forward and I'm a diehard Kiss fan. He's still showing us the way. That's the way I look, just as Paul McCartney is. It, Paul McCartney is 80 years old. Yep. Doing it better think, than all of us. I, I think you're going to get a, a lot of pushback having compared uh, Gene Simmons to Paul McCartney. I'm not comparing him. I'm not comparing him. I'm, I'm saying Paul shows us everything. Paul shows us how it's done. Paul does those beautiful melodic bass lines he showed us all and gene will say this gene is a paul mccartney fan that's why he said that and that, that's so so i'm not i would never compare them okay. paul mccartney is in his stratosphere yeah. it's all the way up there paul mccartney is a god gift to this to this world and to this universe and that's as as a diehard Beatles person myself i don't have to say how great paul mccartney is we all learn from paul mccartney and the beatles that's the truth to this day, Paul McCartney is showing us how it's done live. He's still doing it. I mean, I I only look if I can get a piece of that, you know, a piece of um, of of the base learning, the, the, the base teaching that he he's taught me over the years, just from listening to his records. I just want to get a piece of the knowledge that he has, just a piece, because Paul is is like I be, I truly believe he was a gift to the world. It's like man. What, what we have done without him, like the Beatles, yeah, his songwriting, his bass playing, listen to his bass playing. Oh, I do. I have. I think the reason his bass playing is so great and the reason we all talk about it is just because he he happened to play the bass because the, the previous bass player died, you know, Stuart Sutcliffe. But I, I, he is just as magical on the guitar and on the piano. And yes. He just, he just yes. happens to. So he's, uh, he's, yeah, I agree with everything you said. It, it's, it's very true because I, I mean, <clears throat> it just keeps going on though. And when you see these live shots of Paul, he's singing this straight melody with this beautiful melody that he wrote and this incredible bass line under that. He's doing both at the same time. And I just, you know, you just, it inspires you. So like, how do, how do I do just a piece of that? I, I'm, Cause I'm a student, I'm a student of bass. I love Me bass too. players. I love learning. I'll learn something from you, John. I always learn from Paul because I put on the record and just listen to something that I never heard before. There's always something. There's always a little egg, a little nugget, and, you know, a little Easter egg somewhere. Yep. That, did you hear that? And you got to go back and you got to learn it. I'm, I'm, I'm crazy like that. I have to learn the little parts. It's so important. And how with this great bass line, how did he sing that great? Singing great melodies on top of that. And he created it. He created it. It's, it's a passion of mine to learn that. And it still is. And that's what I think people like Paul McCartney keep it interesting and keep it fun for me. So the younger players out there, please listen to Paul McCartney. It's very, very important. It's because I want that kind of person to keep who gets something from that to write songs. Cause I want to hear what they come out of. Cause I think the world needs that music. You know, we'll always have the Beatles. Thank God on record. Mm -hmm. The reason mm -hmm. I brought up Gene Simmons is because I wanted to ask you who your bass influences are. Uh, yeah. Gene, I know is one. Um, I, I guess it's safe to say Paul McCartney is yeah. <laughs> another influence. Uh, I, I think I saw what, what uh, Steve Harris and Getty. They, well, who, who were your uh, well, bass? Yeah. Once you and again, coming from this, this thing, these bass players became my father figures coming from the abandonment. No dad, nobody to look up to, right? I needed something to believe in. 
So bass players became my thing, right? So like, I, I want to do that. They're showing me the way. So there's Getty Lee, Getty, uh, Geezer Butler, Steve Harris, right? Those were my main focus. And then I sprouted up. Then I learned about the Beatles after that. Then I learned how great Paul McCartney was and all this great stuff. Um, you know, I, I just like learning from different different takes on, on the bass. I think it's really important. And look, I'm not the, the best bass player in the world by far, but I just, I, I consider myself a student who's always willing to learn. I think that's the whole key. Always, even to this day, I'll jam a, a Rush song and the stuff that Getty Lee does on bass that will freak them, freak me the hell out. It's like, and I'll have to review it nonstop it's like, until I get it right. I think that's the fun of it all. Cause you can't lose that fun, right? Because we're still kids. In my mind, I'm still a kid. I, hope, I don't look it, but I, I'm still a kid that has to listen to my teachers. These guys are my teachers of, in life. Not only, not only bass, they, I think they showed me how to do it. And uh, it really helped me when I was growing up because there was really not a lot to look up to. And I said, wait, these guys are doing it with bass and music. And it really all made sense to me. And I was very lucky to have that. I thought I, I just locked into that, that if I just lock into this bass thing and these, these heroes that I have, it will lead the way. And I, I was lucky enough to do well, that. You, you raise another good point. And I, I didn't have this as one of the things I was going to ask you about, because I just thought about it now. Your dad left. You're the oldest. So you didn't have a father figure to look up to. No. But at the time, you had four younger siblings. Yeah. Did, did they look to you and did that put more pressure on you to be like, you know, the man of the house? It did. And for me to leave, for me to leave the house, because I, I had to go move my grandmother. Remember what we're talking yeah. about when I got beat up, I was getting beat up so badly. It became so dangerous yeah. for me to stay there because my health was going down, not only physically, obviously, the obvious beating up mentally, I was going off the edge because I was, it was traumatic. It was traumatic getting up and putting my clothes on to go to out the door, knowing that I was going to get a beating. I was going to get a beating every, it wasn't fun, to, to, I, not school and test. I didn't worry about school and test. I was worried about how the hell am I going to get to school? You know, a lot, you know, sometimes I thought a lot, is this going to be that day that these guys just keep going? And you couldn't get around it. So my mom, thank God, she said to my grandmother in the Bronx, this is too much because he's, I was freaking out. I was freaking out. I was shaking. I remember I was shaking, getting, opening the door, going to school because, you know, there's no other way to get there. There's one path. So my mother said to my grandma, my mother said to my grandmother, would you mind bring, taking Frank in? Because it's getting really bad. It, you know, he can't, he's, even if it didn't happen one day, it was still the traumatic walk. That walk was evil. It was just, I, I still think about that walk every day. And well, where are they going to come out from? But I, I don't well, I'm not getting that, that you going to your mom said, I, I, I don't want to go to school. I can't do it. You, you It sounds like you just faced it. And for some I reason, faced everything. Did it anyway, I was always like that. I, I kind of faced everything. I tried to I tried to maneuver. I always try to maneuver because I know I had to get to school because I didn't want to fail. I wanted to get to school and get these things done because there was there's a part of life that I just want to get on with. And to get that, it was always that hump of getting around these two guys, it was really rough. And the, and it was really getting in the way when I was, when I was, I remember when I was shaking, I, I was actually shaking, walking down the, the road. I said, something's got to change. And my mother finally, you know, that's when she called my grandmother, you know, would you mind taking him in going back down to the, cause I was born in the Bronx. So I went to live with my grandmother in the Bronx where Charlie Benanti, anthrax drummer, he's my uncle. He lived in that house. And Charlie really introduced me to a, whole new world of music because he was a great drummer. Charlie played drums at four years old. Wow. So, and he was a great drummer. He was even back then, man, let me tell you something. He just had this gift. So it was really fun for me to look at and just watch him and said, I want to do music. I really want to do music. And uh, so we, I mean, that's when we started to jam. He, he taught me, you know, he taught me how to do it and, and just like hit the guitar. I saw him do it and I wanted to, I wanted to be in music because I saw Charlie do it. And I said, it would be cool if I can, because it made me feel really good, you know, especially after this, this nonsense. But the thing is, I tell my son this all the time, you fall down, you get pushed down, you get up, you brush yourself off and you go that way and you move on. And that's the whole point. That's the whole point of the book because there's a lot of people hurting out there. 
I should point important. out there is other stuff in the book about, uh, other yeah. than Frank getting beat up. That yeah, I highly, a lot of fun stuff. I highly, yes, there is. I highly recommend it. Fathers, brothers, and sons surviving anguish, abandonment, and anthrax. Yeah, and we'll put a link to that. On, on, thank on, you for that. You know what it is, John? And for the book, you know, it's it's got all these crazy growing up stories. Then it's got me going into anthrax and, and the whole band thing and uh, the ride there. And I'm, I, I have to tell you, I was... Uh, we're going into paperback for this book, which I can't believe, which is awesome, right? In November, November 4th. It's Already? Gonna be released, November 4th. November 4th is going to be released, and I'm, I'm pretty excited. We're putting an EP, a solo EP, that it, songs that came out of after writing this book. Yes. That's, you know, you uh, can't just write then, then I'm book going, and right? leave it. I had, I had to get this stuff out, so I had a lot of angst inside of me after going over it, because this stuff – after kind of like therapy and you, you deal with therapy and all this stuff, and you, you kind of mellow out and learn how to deal with things. Telling these stories again in this book brought up a lot of stuff and a lot of angst. Uh, and song was the way I got out of it. And I started picking up, I picked up a guitar and started, and, and I, it just I started wanna, coming out. I want to ask you about that in a minute. Then I'm sure. gone, right? I'm not saying then I'm gone. That's the title of the EP. Then I'm gone. <laughs> but, and then there, there was some great times talking about, Great touring with people who passed Dimebag Daryl mm-hmm. and Tara, the fun, fun stuff with that, having such great times with him. We've had some great times along this 40 year career with Anthrax. So it's been, it's been a great run. Tell me about your gear, your bass, your bases, your, I know you're a fan of Tech 21. So we got to mention I that. I talk about that quite a lot, you know, because I, I think Tech 21, uh, bass players know Tech 21. They're the, the, for me, they're the standard. And I'm not kissing up here, but I've always used them from way back. My, my sans amp is my sound, to be honest, you know, and, and a lot of people's sounds. I, I, I think people don't say it enough. It, it, I know most of my friends at a bass place have a sans amp, you know, and somewhere in their, in their sound. Right. Um, and that's fine. Um, but I've been a fan of this forever. So yes, I use the sans amp for my sound, but I'm working and I can't talk about it right, right now, but we're working on something really special with sans amp and myself. So we're working on re- something really, really special. I'm so psyched right now. Um, yeah, but the future is bright with that. Now, my next thing is, oh, I'm just going to show because now I can show it off a little bit. Aha. Uh-huh. That is, this will be called my new Frank Bellow signature bass with Charvel guitars. Charvel, okay. Charvel basses. Cool. This bass, it took us a while to get it together but it's exactly what I want. When I say exactly, because I've had this bass in my head for about eight years uh, about what I wanted in my next signature bass. And I think we got it right. It, it, I think we got it right the first time. It sounds like I'm playing so much more now. All right. I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into your advice for bass players. I mean, you've already given a lot of it, yeah. but let me, let me give you a little context. Most of the people that I'm attracting here at for bass players who, who are coming to learn bass are men in their fifties, sixties, seventies. I got an email the other day, a guy says going to be 76 uh, in, in a month or two. He's it. been with me for years. So wh- when you say young players, maybe, maybe what you really mean is newer players. Well, I, I do, but I, I, I just want the next generation, which is great, yeah. but I also want people to feel what I feel. I want like at my clinics, I have, it's great because I have from an 11 year old boys and girls to yeah. 15, 60, and 70 year old men, which and, and and women, by the way, and women. So I have to say and that I was gonna say coming. that too. We get a fair bit of women also. And, and you know what? There's a lot of great women bass players. I said everybody's look, everybody's invited to the show. That's the way I look at I want everybody to play bass. Everybody. I want everybody to be happy. So yeah, and I get that at my clinic. So there's nothing like John, there's nothing like this feeling of a, at a clinic, and I say this in some of my other interviews, of me playing and and I say, how many new players do we have? And people raise their hand, which is awesome because it's, it's it's intimidating. It totally is intimidating to raise your hand and say, well, I'm, I'm a new player because I don't want to talk above anybody because I don't think anybody should make anybody feel small. It's not not my thing, man. So I've had people six in their 60s just starting to play bass, right? Yeah. Raising their hand. So I say, who's a new player? I said, come on up here. I want them to feel, I want to put my bass on them, right? And they're fans, the, the anthrax, all that stuff by playing. That's great. But I want them to feel my rig. I want them to feel that. I want them to play that 
first couple of notes on the stage in front of people. I think it's so important that I'm there. I want to be a, a safety cushion for them, right? I'm, it's going to be okay. We're going to do two easy notes. We're going to start. Give me a couple of E's. E, E, E. And I put the, I put the bass on. They start playing E. Let's go to F, G, G, G. You know, or, or, and we go up to scale. And the face that they have on when I put that bass on them is not only priceless, but it's everything that I want to do. It's I want to pass this thing over to you because that feeling that you're feeling right now, that when I put that bass, that's what I want you to feel. I want you to, every time you put on a bass and you play bass, I want you to feel that excitement. So you want to learn. It'll, it'll, it'll encourage you to learn. And that, that's what's so important to me. You know, it's going to make you want to do more. I want to feel, you want that high. How do I feel high again? You feel high by learning and you learn. It'll make you want to get to that next page, right? The next page of learning. I think it, so to me, it's still a joy. It's still a joy. I was just seeing, and, and they come back the next time to the next clinic say, and Frank, check this out. So he'll show me this great, or she'll show me this great line they learned. Say, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about right there. It's, and look, I'm no base teacher. I'm not a base teacher. I've learned through my era. You know, I didn't do any serious studying. But what I know, I, I want to push forward and, and make people feel comfortable with learning. I think it's important. What would you be if you weren't a bass player? Something outside of music. Great question. You know what? I always wanted to be a baseball player when I was young. That was one of my dreams, but I'm glad it didn't go that way. Because uh, I don't know if I would have made anything out of that. Music was always my first love, though. So I couldn't deny that. That's for sure. Because that was my, my safety net, my, my outlet we were talking about before. So mm -hmm. baseball was, and you know what, if that didn't work, I, I you know, that's a good question. That's a good question. I, I, I would have done something sales wise, I think selling something, you know, I think that that's, uh, that's fun, you know? Yeah. Well, Frank, I can go on like this all day. There's so much other stuff. <laughs> I know I babble a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, I love talk. talking bass. And you're easy, John. Let's face it. You're easy to talk. It's good. Well, uh, thank you. I'm asking a lot of questions. So uh, the, the, the babble is good. Babble in a babbling is fun. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, the, the tour has not kicked off yet. The we start our first show is in Arizona on the 26th of July. What? This is the 40th anniversary tour for now. Right, right, we'll do so. this. And then we bring it over to the UK and the Europe and Europe. Not this specific tour, but Anthrax. We're doing this with Black Label and Hatebreed. Two great bands. So it's a great package. On the, it starts, look it up, anthrax.com. Uh, and all my stuff on at the Frank Bello, if you guys are interested. Uh, all my stuff is on at the Frank Bello, my book, all that stuff, the Charvel stuff. Um, this, this tour is going to be fun because it's a bunch of good friends, old time friends, Black Label, Black Label Society, and Hatebreed. And is just it, a great uh, JD DeServio, is he still playing bass with them? JD is obviously there. Another another hard key player. And JD is a good. We just did another interview with you together, and we had um, we had a blast. He's a good old friend and a great bass player. Underrated. JD is an underrated great bass player. He's incredible. But um, I'm looking forward to it. this. Is going to be this is going to be one of those fun things that the backstage stuff is going to be just as crazy as the the, the, the front of the stage. So be careful. Yeah, um, yeah. Within reason. Well, not too careful. Let's have some fun. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And then we bring Anthrax goes up to UK, which we haven't been in forever, and Europe. Uh, so we're having uh, we're having with uh, municipal waste. That's what we're going with. So we're having we're having fun with this 40th year anniversary. And then um, next year, hopefully, uh, we'll have a record and all that good stuff. And uh, oh, and the uh, future is bright for music again. Thank God. You know, we just want to move on, right? Everybody just wants to move on and get our lives back. Congratulations. 40 years. That is a very big deal. Doesn't feel like that, but yeah, it's, it's funny, right, John, how fast time flies. Uh, yeah. We don't realize it until it's here. It's like, my God, my, my kid's 16 now. What, what, is, what happened there? You know, but it is, it is yeah. what it is. My youngest guitar player just graduated from Berkeley in, in Boston. And uh, it was great oh, at the awesome. ceremony. Uh, Chuck, Chuck Rainey was honored and uh, awesome. And uh, Layla Hathaway and uh, James Newton Howard. Oh, and then and then the president of Berkeley says uh, there's one other person who's going to be given an honorary doctorate in a few uh, in the coming weeks or months. Uh, I'm pretty sure this man needs no introduction. Roll the tape. It's Ringo. He says, "Hey, everybody, peace and love, peace <laughs> and love." Yes. Awesome. But, uh, you you mentioned uh, great female bass players. Divinity rocks. 
was there and, awesome. and I, i'm looking because they show that you know giant videos of the there was a concert the night before and she she played bass she did this incredible rap i'm not a big fan of rap but that was pretty awesome it's still rhythm right it's still yeah, rhythm absolutely. that's the way i look at it it's it's yeah. look this i'm just happy that you and i are talking bass you know in in a vibrant kind of way in a, in a forward-looking way it's it's so nice that it's it's vibrant right now you know, there's a lot more to go. That's that's it, man. We're, we're still, I still, I'm still chasing it. Whatever that is, we really don't know what it is, but I'm still chasing it, and I don't care because it's fun, and that's what life is about: chasing it and going for it, and having that the energy and yeah, this music thing. Thank God for it, right? That's what that's what life's about, man. Can't think of a better note to end on. Thank you so much, Frank Bellog, and congratulations on. So many things, 40 years of anthrax. Thank you, the John. Book that I, I'm surprised that the paperback is coming out so soon after the initial publication, the EP, everything else. Congratulations. Much luck. Continued success to you and have a great time, but be careful on the Thank tour. You, and uh, I look forward to our paths crossing again soon and often. We will. We will, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank Bello. Our special guest this week, I told Told you it was a special one. Frank Bellow. I'm John Liebman. You're watching the number one site for learning bass online for bassplayersonly.com, where I've taken all the frustration out of learning bass so you can build confidence, have fun, and just enjoy making music. Remember, it's not for everyone. It's for bassplayersonly.com. Thanks again, Frank Bellow. Thank you, we'll John. see you all next week. I'm John Liebman. Let's play bass. Thank you.